What is existentialism? Its earliest themes dwell upon the human subject and upon the meaninglessness and the nothingness of human existence and the anxiety and the foreboding which result. Listen to the anxiety of Søren Kierkegaard, one of the forerunners of existentialism, who lived out his short life in Denmark in the first half of the 19th century. Kierkegaard says, I stick my finger into existence. It smells of nothing. Where am I? What is this thing called the world? Who is it who has lured me into the thing and now leaves me here? Who am I? How did I come into the world? Why was I not consulted? The meaninglessness of my existence, says Kierkegaard, fills me with anxiety and despair, with a sense of hopelessness and deep depression. The life of modern man is lived in despair, he says. There is no one who does not have anxiety in the face of his existence. A year before he died, Kierkegaard summed up the agony of the beginning and end of life with these powerful words. He says, hear the cry of the mother at the hour of giving birth. See the struggle of the dying at the last moment of life. And say then whether that which begins and that which ends like this can be designed for pleasure. Human life is not designed for pleasure, Kierkegaard tells us, but in the time given to us, to each of us, for our own existence, the time between the birth cry of our mothers and our own final death cry, we strive for happiness in order to escape anxiety and despair. But there is no escape, no matter how pleasurable and comfortable we try to make our lives in order to hide from the truth. For the truth is, Kierkegaard insists, that all of us live in anxiety and despair. This is the universal human condition. We suffer from anxiety, even when we are not aware of it. And even when there is nothing to fear, nothing in the objective world to feel anxious about. This is because at bottom, says Kierkegaard, our anxiety is not objective at all. It is subjective anxiety. It is the universal fear of something that is nothing. It is the fear of the nothingness of human existence. Kierkegaard tells the story of an ordinary man who merely wants to be happy. But he is worried because he can't sustain his happiness. He keeps falling into depression. And he asks himself, is he getting older? Has he lost his drive? Is his world slipping away? But then he pulls himself together and he makes something of himself. He gets ahead in his career and he soon acquires a wife and family and social status in his community. But then the old depression comes back with even greater intensity than before. This man has made something of himself, says Kierkegaard, but he is a stranger to himself. He does not know that the way to overcome despair is to choose despair, to sink so deep into despair that you give up all the satisfactions and comforts of your life. You will lose all commitment to family, friends, and community. You will surrender reason and all belief in the truth of science and philosophy and all moral principles. When all these are lost with nothing left, you will be in total crisis at the edge of the abyss and you will be prepared then for faith in God. You will choose God and make the leap of faith to God. For Kierkegaard, only absolute faith and the leap to God can overcome the meaninglessness of your existence. And only the restoration of orthodox Christianity and the surrender of reason can overcome the sense of anxiety and despair for the solitary individuals of the modern world. But for Friedrich Nietzsche, who is usually regarded along with Kierkegaard as a forerunner of existentialism, Kierkegaard's religious solution to the problem of the meaninglessness of modern life is totally unacceptable. It is unacceptable to Nietzsche, first of all, because it represents the human individual as weak and powerless and even cowardly. It strips you, the individual person, of all human strength, so that in the depths of despair, your total loss of faith in yourself 
propels you into absolute faith in God to solve your problems in living. But Nietzsche would find Kierkegaard's religious solution unacceptable for a far more fundamental reason. Kierkegaard can be seen as the champion of the orthodox Christianity of the past, trying to solve the problems of modern man by turning the clock back to an older Christian absolutism, which requires the surrender of the self to God. But this is now impossible, says Nietzsche, because God is dead. The concept of the death of God is perhaps the best known of all of Nietzsche's many compelling contributions to philosophy. In Nietzsche's book, The, Joy, the Joyful Wisdom, Nietzsche represents the shocking story of a madman who on a bright morning lighted a lantern and ran to a marketplace to announce that God is dead. And Nietzsche writes, We have killed him, cried the madman, you and I, we are all his murderers. And then thinking about the world in the absence of God, the madman says, do we not now wander through an endless nothingness? Does not empty space breathe upon us? Has it not now become colder? Does not night come on continually darker and darker? By the concept of the death of God, Nietzsche does not mean that God, who is defined as an eternal being, can nevertheless die. To say that, would of course be illogical. What is eternal is like Parmenides' unchanging one. It does not come into being or pass out of being. By the death of God, Nietzsche means the death of our belief in God. It is our belief in God that is dead. It has finally succumbed to multiple attacks, including the savage beating it received from the empiricist David Hume, as we have seen. But if we have lost our belief in God, have we not lost the foundation of all our truth and morality? Did not even Descartes, that supremely independent rationalist, have to call upon God to guarantee that his clear and distinct ideas were true, and so to be the foundation of all truth? Is this not the crisis of the modern world, that in the loss of our belief in God, we have lost the foundation of our truth and value? Yes, says Nietzsche, but although man has lost the belief in God, this will enable him to lose his childlike dependency upon God. Humanity will now find the courage to live like adults in a world without God. The greatest need of civilization now, says Nietzsche, is to develop adults, it is to develop a new type of individual, to develop supermen who will be hard, strong, and courageous, and who will be intellectually and morally independent. These supermen will break the stone slabs on which the old Judeo-Christian moral laws are inscribed, those old moral laws to which the masses are still enslaved. The only morality of the superman will be to affirm life, to say yes to life, to be powerful, creative, joyous, and free. Kierkegaard counsels us to sink into despair so that we can make the leap of faith to God. Nietzsche counsels us to be masters, not slaves to God, and to be hard, strong, vital, creative, and joyous. And Nietzsche tells us why he rejects the philosophy of despair. He is afraid that it would destroy him. To Nietzsche, Philosophies are not intellectual games or abstractions. Philosophies have the power to enhance and strengthen your life and even your health, or to weaken and destroy you. And Nietzsche says that he created his philosophy of the strong, powerful, life-affirming superman, as he says, out of my will to be in good health, out of my will to live. Self-preservation forbade me to practice a philosophy of wretchedness and discouragement. Why did, how did the profoundly divergent philosophies of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche prepare the way in the 19th century for the existentialist philosophy of the 20th century? First of all, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, like Marx in the middle years of the 19th century, 
perceived the Western world to be approaching a time of crisis. All three, Marx, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche, address their philosophies to the coming crisis. They offer a diagnosis of their own time and a prescription for what ought to be done. Secondly, both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche reject any diagnosis of the crisis which treats the problem as a collective problem, one of social or economic classes or of groups as Marx did, or as a problem of nation states as Hegel did. For Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and for the existentialism which follows them, the individual human consciousness is the only key to the diagnosis and cure of human problems. Existentialism maintains that in philosophies such as those of Hegel and Marx, with their exclusive sociological concern with social groups, social classes, and the social system, the individual human self disappears. It is swallowed up by the group. Thirdly, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche prepare the way for existentialism by rejecting, as existentialism will later reject, all past philosophies. Past philosophies have had no interest in philosophizing about human existence, and they have had no interest in the effect of philosophy upon the consciousness of the human subject. And lastly, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche share an intense and subtle concern with psychology, with mental states, and especially with neurotic and psychotic states of the individual. Like all the existentialists who follow them, they must be called psychologizing philosophers. They are subtle and sometimes masterful interpreters of the psychology of the human subject who is the focus of all their concerns. Existentialism develops in the 20th century within Germany and France, not as a direct result of any specific set of circumstances or causes, but as a deeply experienced response to the crumbling of many structures in the Western world which had previously been regarded as stable. The eruption of World War I finally destroyed the belief in the continuing progress of civilization to peace and prosperity which the Enlightenment had fostered and which had survived until the outbreak of this war. With World War I, there came the collapse of the seemingly stable balance of power among the great nations. Before World War I had ended, there crumbled away the empire of all the Russias, and there soon began the crumbling away and collapse of the far-flung British Empire and the French, Belgian, and Dutch empires. The Communist Revolution of 1917 in Russia shattered the confidence in political stability, the confidence that the revolutionary era was now over. Economic structures also were perceived to crumble as the great economic depression of the late 1920s and 1930s rolled from Europe to the United States, raising doubts about the enduring truth of classical economics and doubts about the survival of capitalism. Science itself began to surrender its claims to certitude, and philosophies of all types were crumbling away. Inroads into the territory of philosophy were made by science. Furthermore, philosophy was under continuous attack from the empiricists, and increasingly, philosophies were charged with being historically relative, or even worse, with being ideologies serving a group interest. With the weakening and collapse of so many external structures of authority, authoritative economic, political, and intellectual structures, all these structures begin to lose their legitimacy they begin to appear illegitimate and intolerably repressive and coercive upon the individual. The individual then responds by rejecting the external authority of government, the economic system, and the scientific and intellectual world, and turns to himself instead as authority. In this way, existentialists turn to the human self as the true center of philosophy. 20th century existentialism was following the path of 19th century German Romanticism. Like German Romanticism, 20th century existentialism rejected government, economics, politics, and philosophy as authorities, and centered philosophy upon the human spirit, the conscious human subject, as the only legitimate authority. What then is existentialism? There exists now a widely accepted definition of existentialism. It is that existentialism is the philosophic standpoint which gives priority to existence over essence. What is meant by this is that existentialism 
gives primacy or priority in significance to existence in the sense of my conscious existence, my existence as a conscious subject, rather than to any essence which may be assigned to me, any definition of me, any explanation of me by science or philosophy or religion or politics. Existentialism affirms the ultimate significance, the primacy of my existence as this flickering point of consciousness of which I am now aware, my here and now conscious existence as against all efforts to define me, to reduce me to a platonic essence or to a Cartesian mental substance or to a Hegelian carrier of the spirit of my culture or to a scientific neurological mechanism or to a social security number. Essentialism is the name sometimes given by existentialism to the mode of thinking which it opposes, to the mode of thinking which gives priority to essence rather than to existence. Essentialism is the mode of thinking which seeks to conceptualize me, to assign me to an essence, to fit me into a system, to analyze me by means of some technology. Existentialism, by contrast, existentialism cries out that man in his concrete existence as a conscious being has been neglected by philosophy, science, political organizations, and by religion. What of the life of the auto mechanic? What of the life of the college freshman, the dry cleaner's delivery man, the nurse, the shoe salesman? They are accounted for, explained, defined by philosophy, science, religion, and politics. But existentialism says that their existence as conscious beings is a significant problem. Their conscious existence is precisely the unseen and neglected problem. In our time in the contemporary world, existentialism is that philosophic voice which is rising and can be heard in all the areas of social life, art, and learning. It is a voice which calls upon artists, scientists, philosophers, politicians, theologians to be concerned with the perceptions and feelings of the human subject as against the standardized ways in which human beings are programmed and analyzed as if they were things. Existentialism may thus be seen as the champion and defender of the human spirit against the oppressiveness of mass society, against the oppressiveness of science, philosophy, and organized religion. Its concerns are narrow. Existentialism focuses solely upon human existence. Existentialism has no philosophy of nature or of science or of history. It is a philosophy of human existence, a philosophy of man. But how can one approach concrete human existence? If you try to discover human existence by sense perception, by observation, you will find that this is a trap because sense perception does not lead you to the conscious subject. It leads you to observation, experimentation, empiricism, and to science. This is the scientific trap. But trying to approach concrete existence by reason turns out to be another trap. The root of reason leads you to essences, definitions, and rationalism. This is the old philosophic trap. What then is the path to my conscious existence? You can take the path of either crisis or of communion. A crisis is a happening which suddenly removes you from the ordinary context of your life. You cannot react at this point with your everyday habitual responses, and you are thrown back upon yourself as when you find yourself in a blackout in Times Square in New York, or in a blackout in your room when you awaken in the night and sense someone standing close to your bed. Or there is the crisis in the crowded restaurant when someone at the next table chokes on food and begins to turn purple. At such moments of crisis, you become aware of your conscious existence with sudden excruciating clarity. The other path to conscious existence is by way of communion, by way of the self-discovery which occurs at the moment of becoming one with a group. Self-discovery can happen at a time of ecstatic religious unity or of ecstatic political unity, such as what was produced by Martin Luther King's march on Selma, Alabama a few years ago. But how then can you present the discovery of the self in the experience of a crisis or the experience of communion? One powerful way is by describing the crisis or communion as they were experienced. And this has led existentialists to literary description and to a great outpouring of short stories, novels, plays, biographies, and autobiographies. The other way is to philosophize, but to do so not with the traditional concepts of philosophy, 
but with new, strange concepts and themes such as existentialism uses. Nausea, anxiety, nothingness, authenticity. Let us turn then to the themes of existentialism, the themes which may be said to characterize the mode of thought of those who would call themselves existentialists. First, there is the basic existentialist standpoint, which we have already considered. It is the standpoint that existence precedes essence, has primacy over essence. Man is a conscious subject rather than an object to be known or manipulated. He exists as a conscious being and not in accordance with any definition, essence, generalization, or system. Existentialism says, I am nothing else but my own conscious existence. A second existentialist theme is that of anxiety or the sense of anguish. This theme is as old as Kierkegaard within existentialism. It is the claim that anxiety is the underlying, all-pervasive, universal condition of human existence. Existentialism agrees with certain streams of thought in Judaism and Christianity, which see human existence as fallen and human life as lived in suffering and sin, in guilt and anxiety. Along with this dark and sorrowful picture of human life, there exists in existentialism the view that happiness, optimism, a sense of well-being, or the serenity of stoicism, these can only reflect a superficial understanding of life, or a naive and foolish way of viewing the despairing, the tragic aspect of human existence. A third existentialist theme is that of absurdity. Granted, says the existentialist, I am my own existence. But this existence is absurd. To exist as a human being is inexplicable and wholly absurd. Each of us is simply here, thrown into this time and place. But why now? Why here? We saw Kierkegaard ask. For no reason. And so my life is absurd. Listen to these words of Pascal, the great French mathematician and philosopher of Descartes' time, who was also a forerunner of existentialism. Pascal says, when I consider the short duration of my life, swallowed up in the eternity before and after, the little space I fill and even can see, engulfed in the infinite immensity of space of which I am ignorant and which knows me not. I am frightened and am astonished at being here rather than there. Why now rather than then? A fourth theme which pervades existentialism is that of nothingness or the void. If no essences define me, and if as an existentialist I reject all of the philosophies, sciences, and religions that attempt to give a specific structure both to me and to my world, then there is nothing that structures my world. I will have followed Kierkegaard's lead. I will have stripped myself of all structure, all human ties, all knowledge and moral value, and I will stand in anxiety at the edge of the abyss. I am my own existence, but my existence is a nothingness if all definitions, all truth, all structures are to be stripped away. I live then without anything to structure my life, and I am looking into emptiness and the void, hovering over the abyss in fear and trembling, and living the life of dread. Related to the theme of nothingness is the existentialist theme of death. Nothingness in the form of death, which is my final nothingness, hangs over me like a sword of Damocles all my life. I am filled with anxiety at moments when I permit myself to be aware of this. At those moments, says Martin Heidegger, one of the German existentialist philosophers, the whole of my being seems to drift away into nothing. The unaware person tries to live as if death is not actual. He tries to escape its reality. But Heidegger says that my death is my most authentic, significant moment. Nobody else can die for me. Death is my personal potentiality. And if I take death into my life and acknowledge it and face it squarely, I will free myself from the anxiety of death and from the pettiness of life. But here, the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre begs to differ. What is death, he asks. Death is my total non-existence. Death is as absurd as birth. It is not an ultimate, authentic moment of my life. It is nothing but the wiping out of my existence. It is only another witness to the absurdity of human existence. Alienation or estrangement is a sixth theme which characterizes existentialism. Alienation is a theme which goes back to Hegel and in many subtle forms. 
The most profound alienation of all in Hegel's thought was the alienation or estrangement between my consciousness and its object, in which I am aware of the otherness of the object and seek in a variety of ways to overcome its alienation by mastering it, by bringing it back into myself in some way. As for Marx, we have seen that in the split between the two Marxisms, the young Marx is devoted to the concept of alienation in the sense of the economic alienation of the worker. How then do existentialists use the concept of alienation? Apart from my own conscious being, all else, they say, is otherness from which I am estranged. We are hemmed in, they say, by a world of things which are opaque to us and which we cannot understand. Science has alienated us from nature by its outpouring of, out, of overbearing and unintelligible concepts, laws, theories, technologies. These products of science now stand between us and nature. And the Industrial Revolution has alienated the worker from the product of his own labor and has made him into a thing in the productive system, as Marx has taught us. We are also estranged, say the existentialists, from human institutions, from bureaucratized governments on the federal, state, and local levels, from national political parties, giant business corporations, national religious organizations. All of these are vast, impersonal sources of power which appear to have a life of their own. The individual can neither feel that he is part of them, nor can he even understand them. We live in alienation from our own institutions. Moreover, say the existentialists, we are shut out of history. We no longer have a sense of having roots in a meaningful past, nor do we see ourselves as moving toward a meaningful future. As a result, we do not belong to the past, to the present time, or to the future. And lastly, and perhaps most painfully, the existentialist points out that all of our personal human relations are poisoned by feelings of alienation. Alienation arises within the family, between parents and children, between the husband and the wife, and between the children. Alienation affects all social and work relations, and most cruelly, alienation dominates the relationship of love. These are the disturbing, provocative themes which can be found in contemporary existentialism. But now we must ask, if this is indeed the human condition, if this is a true picture of the world in which the human subject absurdly finds himself, how is it possible to go on living in it? Is there no exit from this nothingness and despair, this absurdity, this fixation upon death and alienation, this hovering on the edge of the abyss? Is there any existentialist who can tell us how to live in such an absurd and hopeless world? Is there an existentialist ethics, a moral philosophy to tell us what is good, what can be said to be right or wrong in such a meaningless world? For the ethics of existentialism, we will turn next time to Paris and to the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre. I hate my childhood and everything that remains from it. This is the bitter statement of the French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre in the autobiography entitled The Words, which he wrote when he was in his late 50s and which describes his life up to the age of 12. Sartre's autobiography is a biting, aggressive attack upon his father and mother, his grandparents, and the bourgeois society into which he was born. Sartre attacks all of these from his viewpoint as an existentialist and also from his more recent Marxist position. It is doubtful whether any other intellectual or artist has ever written such a hostile description of his own childhood. What was this childhood like, the childhood of the most influential existentialist philosopher of the 20th century? Sartre was born in Paris in 1905. His father was a second lieutenant in the French Navy who had contracted an intestinal disease while on duty in French Indochina and died when Jean-Paul was only 15 months old. Sartre's mother, Anne-Marie, had no option but to return with her infant son uh, to the home of her parents, Charles and Louise Schweitzer. The Schweitzer family had their roots in Alsace, which had become part of Germany. Anne-Marie's first cousin and her father's nephew was the famous Protestant theologian and medical missionary to Africa, Albert Schweitzer. The household in which Jean-Paul grew up was dominated by his grandfather, Charles Schweitzer, a language teacher, the author of a German language textbook used in all French schools, and the inventor of a new direct method of teaching languages. 
Although Charles Schweitzer had been ready for retirement, he went back to teaching in order to support Anne-Marie and her son. And in return, Anne-Marie became, in effect, an unpaid housekeeper for her parents and was treated as a child again, totally subordinate to their instructions and wishes. Sartre makes the point that as a young child, he was already perceiving in his grandparents' treatment of his mother the exploitation practiced by the bourgeoisie and the hypocrisy with which they concealed this exploitation and selfishness with high-sounding liberal principles. Sartre's autobiography is especially savage in exposing the bourgeois hypocritical pretentiousness of Charles Schweitzer. Charles Schweitzer was a tall, handsome, bearded man whom Sartre describes as looking so much like God the Father that he was often taken for him. But although he ruled the household by playing the role of a stern, godlike patriarch, Charles Schweitzer soon became completely devoted to his grandson and kept him at home until he was 10 years old, supplying him with tutors rather than submit him to the inferior standards and the less gifted students of the public schools. Here again, Sartre discovers bourgeois hypocrisy concealed behind the grandfather's high-sounding, noble intentions of treating the small boy as a child prodigy who deserves superior private education, there was a profoundly selfish motive. The presence of the small boy in the household served to alleviate Charles Schweitzer's fear of his own death. And so it was for a selfish reason, hypocritically concealed by bourgeois ideals of superior education, that the young Jean-Paul Sartre was kept at home for five years beyond the normal time for entering school. He received a poor education from irregular tutoring, he was cut off from association with children of his own age, and he was kept a prisoner, sequestered in the apartment on the top floor of number one Rue Le Goff in the Latin Quarter of Paris. Even his physical well-being was neglected by his grandparents. Sartre tells us they failed to notice and to get medical help for a growth in his right eye which was to give him a wall-eyed, cross-eyed look, for which he is famous, and eventually brought about the loss of sight in that eye. This was another example of the bourgeois hypocrisy with its lofty claims to humane concern for others, actually concealing indifference and selfishness. There was, however, one advantage uh, in being kept sequestered on the top floor uh, of the apartment building at number one Rue Le Goff, and that was the small boy lived in a world of books, the books which overflowed his grandfather's study, the lending library books of his grandmother, the books from which Anne Marie read him stories. I began my life, Sartre says, as a, I shall no doubt end it, amidst books. The words in these books became the world which the boy longed to possess and manipulate, and by the age of three, he was wild with joy, as he says. He had taught himself how to read. And responding to the flatteries of his grandfather, the small boy became a little monster, cleverly playing the role of a child prodigy. And he took the next step. He began to write his own books. But it was Charles Schweitzer who pronounced the words which decided Sartre's fate, his lifelong vocation, his original project, which became the project to which he has given his entire life the project of writing, of becoming a writer. Sartre in his autobiography recalls this occasion when his grandfather became deadly serious and talking man to man to the seven-year-old boy who was sitting on his lap, the grandfather said that it was understood, of course, that the boy would be a writer, but that he should be warned that literature did not fill a man's belly. This was the moment, hearing these words, when Sartre made his own original choice of what he would become. And as we will see, Sartre's existentialism claims that a similar event occurs in the development of all persons, a moment when the person chooses the original project which will color the rest of his life. But Charles Schweitzer was given no credit even for this, for his role in Sartre's choice of his vocation, his life's project as a writer. Instead, Sartre condemns the view of literature which he acquired from his grandfather, the view that literature can provide man's salvation. At the end of his autobiography, Sartre says, he has finally smashed that illusion to bits. Literature, he now sees, doesn't save anything or anyone. Literature, he says, is only a mirror which gives us a picture of ourselves. He sees now that his writing career was a fake, the bourgeois artist's pretension that he is God, a savior of mankind. 
But by now, this faking, this imposture, has eaten its way into his character, and he knows that he can never be cured of that. I still write, he says, what can I do? Sartre's education, once he was liberated from his grandfather's apartments, was provided by some of the finest schools in France, culminating in the École Normale Supérieure, a graduate school for the training of university professors, the most intellectual and exclusive of all French graduate schools. After Sartre's graduation, there came the competitive examinations for college teachers of philosophy, which Sartre failed the first time. The second time, however, Sartre took first place, and the second place was taken by Simone de Beauvoir. They had met shortly before their exams in the spring of 1929, and they have been lovers and friends and also partners in philosophy and politics ever since for 50 years, while always defiantly rejecting bourgeois marriage for themselves. Simone de Beauvoir is an important contributor in her own right to French existentialism, short stories and novels, a study of women called the second sex, and many philosophical essays. Most of what we know about Sartre comes from her own autobiography, which is now in four volumes. They both began teaching philosophy in colleges, Sartre in the northern port city of Le Havre, de Beauvoir in the Mediterranean port of Marseille. In 1933-34, Sartre was able to be released from teaching, which he regarded as imprisonment, both for himself and for his students, by gaining a scholarship for himself to the French Institute in Berlin, where Hitler had just a few months before become Chancellor of Germany. Neither Sartre nor de Beauvoir at this time had any knowledge of politics, nor any interest in it. Both of them were passionately opposed to the entire bourgeois world and were dedicated to destroying it. But this they intended to achieve by literature, not by politics. It was during this year of the establishment of Nazi totalitarianism in Germany that Sartre lived as a politically naive and unaware student in Berlin and established for himself his philosophical ties to the currents of philosophy which were then developing in the heavy and dangerous atmosphere of Germany prior to the outbreak of the Second World War. This contemporary German philosophy joined with older great philosophical traditions to be the resources with which the bold and subtle imagination of Jean-Paul Sartre worked. Sartre is attempting to create a philosophy for modern man to live by, a philosophy which will provide guidance for one's life by explaining the nature of the world and by expressing the human condition, what it is like to live as a human being. To which philosophers of the past will he turn for support and from which will he turn away? He turns away from all empiricism because empiricism limits knowledge to sense perception, and empiricism denies that philosophy can provide guidance for human life. Sartre also turns away from rationalistic deduction, such as Descartes, because deduction can neither explain the world nor express what it is like to live as a human being. Who then are the philosophers to whom Sartre turns? Who are the philosophers who are Sartre's powerful resources in the history of philosophy and from whom the richness of Sartre's philosophy is derived? First of all, Sartre's philosophy derives from Descartes, who as the first and greatest of all French philosophers remains a formidable influence upon all French philosophers who have followed him. The influence of Descartes upon Sartre is clear. It is Descartes' subjectivism. It is Descartes' insistence that philosophy begins with the absolute certainty of my consciousness of myself. A second resource upon which Sartre was to draw was the analysis of consciousness that was available in the exciting new philosophy of Edmund Husserl, which Sartre studied intensively during his year at the French Institute in Berlin. Edmund Husserl, a professor of philosophy at Freiburg and other German universities, had originally been a mathematician and a physicist. Like Descartes, who had also been a mathematician and a physicist, Husserl tried to achieve for philosophy the certainty of mathematics. Husserl himself pointed out his similarity to Descartes, that they both attempted to find certainty for philosophy and both found it in the cogito, in the self which thinks and cannot be doubted. What Sartre takes from Husserl's complex and formal philosophy is the discovery, first, that I am not a thing, a thinking substance, as Descartes claimed. I am not substantial, a stable, enduring self. 
And secondly, from Husserl, he takes the concept that Husserl, from Husserl, the consciousness is always of something other than itself. The consciousness is directed toward an object. The consciousness is intentional. A third philosophy upon which Sartre soon draws is that of the German existentialist Martin Heidegger, Husserl's most brilliant student and the successor to Husserl's professorship at the University of Freiburg. From Heidegger, Sartre takes the concept of existence as being in the world and the concept of being thrown absurdly into existence. Also from Heidegger, Sartre takes the concept of man as making himself by having projects into the future. And finally, the distinction between authentic and inauthentic existence. In addition uh, to using Descartes and Husserl for their analysis of consciousness, and Heidegger for his existentialism. In addition to these philosophies, Sartre also finds valuable philosophical materials in the dialectical philosophies of Hegel and Marx and their analysis of self and society, and also in the two major forerunners of existentialism, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. From Hegel, Sartre takes the distinction between the object as it is in itself and the object as it is for a subject. Also, Sartre takes the concept of dialectic from Hegel and uses it in the basic opposition between my conscious being and its nothingness, and in the great opposition between being and nothingness. From Marx, Sartre will attempt in 1960 to take his entire system with some revisions and to incorporate existentialism within Marxism. From Kierkegaard, Sartre takes the emphasis upon existence instead of upon essence and also Kierkegaard's concept of dread. And finally, from Nietzsche, he takes the concept of the bold freedom of the Superman in being a law unto himself, independent of conventional thought or morality. The first significant product of Sartre's philosophical reflections was a novel, the philosophical novel to which his publisher gave the title Nausea. Why a novel? Sartre is already finding his way at this point toward a philosophy of existentialism which will use literature, novels, plays, short stories to grasp concrete human existence, to present my existence, the human condition, the lived life, as distinct from the overlay of essences by which other philosophers, the sciences, social organizations, conceal, distort, and explain away my concrete existence as a conscious being. As Simone de Beauvoir says, a philosopher who makes subjectivity, concrete human existence, central to his viewpoint, is bound to become a literary artist so as to convey the human condition in its full concrete reality. And she adds that only the novel allows a writer to evoke the original gushing forth of existence. Sartre had been working on the novel Nausea for almost a decade, ever since his years in graduate school. When Nausea was published in France in 1938, it was an immediate and huge success. And rapidly in the following years, the principal character of the novel Nausea, Antoine Rocantin, has become a familiar figure in Western civilization. He has become a recognized stable part of our literary world, as have other literary figures, like Shakespeare's Hamlet, or Dickens's Oliver Twist, or James Joyce's Bloom, or Kafka's heroes whose names begin with the letter K. References to Rocantin's concrete existence, to Rocantin's experience, his nausea, his crisis of despair, occur throughout contemporary discussions in the fields of psychology and philosophy, and wherever the consciousness of modern man is examined. Who is Rocantin? And how has Sartre's finest philosophical novel made him into a personality so real for us that he lives among us outside the novel itself? What are the moods and thoughts of this fictional character? And how have they become our own moods and thoughts? The novel is shrewdly presented by Sartre as Rocantin's own diary, a first person account of his daily life written only for himself as a direct and truthful statement of one man's subjectivity, one man's concrete here and now existence. The scene is a port city in France, which has the name of Bouville, which means Mudville. It is clearly a description of the actual port of Le Havre, the main port of France, 
the ugly commercial city in which Sartre lived in cheap hotels near the railroad station while he was teaching philosophy there. In many ways, Roquentin is similar to Sartre. He is close to 30 years old. He comes from a middle-class background and is living on a small inherited income. He is an intellectual and a writer. But Roquentin is represented as being tall, rather than short, as Sartre is, and with red hair, and as having no family ties, no job, no friends. But he had traveled widely. He is a free man, free to do what he wants and he has come to Bouville to finish a biography that he is writing on the life of an 18th century diplomat, the Marquis de Rolbon. But from the very first page, we know that something is wrong. The first page of the diary mentions that a change has come over him, and we soon learn that the whole point of keeping a diary is to determine what this change is and what it means for his life. The best thing, he says in the diary, would be to write down events from day to day. And above all, he says, I must tell how I see this table, this street, the people, my packet of tobacco, since those are the things which have changed. With these words, Sartre has taken us into the psychology of a mind that is aware that it is slipping away from its normal states aware that his world is beginning to take on a strange new appearance and yet he is sufficiently in touch with reality to want to observe his own mental states to want to keep a day-to-day -day account of his psychological symptoms when did it all begin Rockingham remembers that on saturday some children were playing on the waterfront and like them he says i wanted to throw a stone into the sea but when he picked up a stone, he says, I saw something which disgusted me. He is confronted by the stone's bare existence, and he is overwhelmed by a feeling of nausea. Day after day, he lives with depression, nausea, feelings of vertigo, and mounting anxiety. The nausea is becoming constant. It even comes over him in the cafe, which had been a place of refuge, well-lighted, full of people. But now, Rocantan says, the nausea is not inside me. I am the one who is inside it. As the days go by, Rocantan discovers that there is no rational order in existence. Things have no essences which define what they are. There are no fixed laws according to which things relate to other things in the universe. All rationality, all sciences are only of our own making they have nothing to do with the bare existence that they name. Things, says Rokentan, are divorced from their names. And when we face them in their bare existence, they are simply there, loathsome and fearful, and we experience them with nausea. Rokentan is riding on a streetcar in Bouville, and he says, this thing I'm sitting on, leaning my hand on, is called a seat, he says. They made it purposely for people to sit on. They took leather, springs, and cloth. They went to work with the idea of making a seat. And when they finished, that was what they had made. Said Rocantin, I murmur, it's a seat. But the word stays on my lips. It refuses to go and put itself on the thing. It stays what it is with its red plush, thousands of little red paws in the air, all still, little dead paws. And then he says, this enormous belly turned upward, bleeding, inflated, bloated, with all its dead paws. This belly floating in this car, in this gray sky, is not a seat. It could as well be a dead donkey, tossed about in the water. In this agonizing, terrifying fantasy about the red plush seat of the streetcar, Rocantan is discovering that things in their actual existence have nothing to do with the names we give them, and that the existence of things has no connection with the essence which we assign to them. This thing on which he is sitting, is it a streetcar seat? Is this its name? 
is this its essence? That is one interpretation. It could just as well be a thousand little red paws or the red belly of a dead donkey. Things as they exist in their nakedness have no essences. Their existence is not confined by any words or explanations that we give them. Satra and his hero, Rocantin, have here reached the same conclusion as David Hume had reached 200 years earlier. The world of existence, of matters of fact, has no connection with the world of words, reason, mathematics, and logic. Existence is not rational. There is no reason that things are as they are and not otherwise. There is no rational explanation as to why there is any world at all rather than nothing. Why does Sartre respond to the irrationality of existence with a sense of excitement, fear, and nausea? It is because to Sartre, as to Kierkegaard and to Nietzsche before him, philosophies are not intellectual games. Philosophies are things we live by and are a matter of life and death for the human spirit because of their powerful effect upon human psychology. And if it is true, that existence has no rationality and no order, is governed by no scientific laws and by no philosophic essences, then anything can happen in such a universe. The world without any structure falls apart and dissolves, and I myself dissolve along with it. As Rokantan says, in such a world, my tongue may turn into a centipede. 200 years ago, David Hume had said, that since the world is one in which reason and existence have no connection with each other, there is no reason that the sun will rise tomorrow. On the streetcar, Rokentan's nausea moves toward crisis as he feels himself surrounded by nameless, frightening things. He jumps off of the streetcar, runs into the park, and drops onto a park bench. He feels that he is suffocating. Existence penetrates him through his eyes, nose, mouth. And here in front of him are the roots of a chestnut tree protruding from the ground under the bench. And he says, I was sitting, says Rocantin, stooping forward, head bowed, alone, in front of this black, knotty mass, entirely beastly, which frightened me. Then I had this vision. Here, then, is Sartre's famous chestnut tree vision. Never, Rocantin continues, until these last few days had I understood the meaning of existence. And then, all of a sudden, there it was, clear as day. Rocantin looks around at the chestnut tree, the park gates, the fountain, and himself, a red-haired man digesting on a bench. And it suddenly flashes upon him, that none of these things have the slightest reason to be there. None of these things is necessary. They are all simply in the way and superfluous. Rokantan knows now that he has found, as he says, the key to existence, the key to my nausea, to my own life. The key is absurdity, the fundamental lack of any rationality in the existence of things. This root of the chestnut tree this existence escaped all explanation. It was below explanation. It was simply there for no reason, without explanation. And it was absurd. All existence is merely contingent, without any necessity to exist, without any rationality, simply in the way, superfluous. And so it is absurd. Now Rocantin understood his nausea. Nausea is what human beings cannot help feeling in the face of the absurd in the face of a world which is irrational, superfluous, and therefore absurd. This is the world-shattering vision of the chestnut tree. It has now taken its place among the great visionary experiences of human history. But there remained for Rocantin another discovery, this time not about things, but about himself. The self which he has assumed he had, namely Rocantin, this person whom he thought of as having the essence of a man, an intellectual, an historian, the biographer of the Marquis de Rolbon. This, too, is only an interpretation, an essence which he has constructed for himself, but which has nothing to do with his existence. The self exists only as a consciousness which is conscious of a succession of objects, 
There is no enduring self, no Cartesian cogito, no thinking substance. No one lives there anymore, he says. There is only the stream of consciousness of this and that object. And so, in addition to the loss of Descartes' physical substances, there is the loss of the Cartesian self, the thinking substance which Descartes had carefully established. Both are now gone. There are no physical substances. There are no thinking substances. What is now left for Roquentin? Off and on, his nausea had been relieved when an American jazz record was played on the jukebox in the cafe, a record of a black woman singing some of these days. Roquentin has already decided to give up writing the biography, and in the final moment of inspiration, he thinks of the New York musician creating this song some of these days, and he thinks that he too will create something. He is thinking of writing a novel, so that in artistic creation, finally, he will have a reason for living, and perhaps even a way to redeem his life. Next time, we will see how Sartre handles these problems in his great philosophical work, Being and Nothingness. In Jean-Paul Sartre's novel, The Age of Reason, the hero, Matthew, a professor of philosophy, proclaims Sartre's philosophy of human freedom. And he says, he was free, free for everything, free to act like an animal or like a machine. He could do what he wanted to do. Nobody had the right to advise him. He was alone in a monstrous silence free and alone, without an excuse, condemned to decide without an excuse, condemned to decide without any possible recourse, condemned forever to be free. Sartre is famous uh, for the idea that we are condemned to be free. This is an idea which runs through all his writing. What do these frightening words mean? The meaning is made clear in Sartre's great philosophical essay of 1943, Being and Nothingness, which was written during the bitter years of World War II in France. After the Germans, with little opposition, had seized Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland, the great Western powers finally entered the picture, and World War II erupted in 1939. Sartre was drafted, and when the French army surrendered to the Germans in 1940, Sartre became a prisoner of war for nine months. Cleverly, he arranged to be released for reasons of health, and he returned to teaching philosophy in a France which was now occupied by the German army. The experience of France under German rule from 1940 to 1944, transformed Sartre into a political being. He became active in the French resistance movement. He did reporting for an underground newspaper, and he wrote and produced powerful anti-Nazi plays. These years of the German occupation of France were to be the most astonishingly productive of Sartre's life. His major intellectual production during that period was the massive 724-page essay, Being and Nothingness. Sartre had begun to write this systematic statement of his philosophic viewpoint during the gloomy winter of 1942 in occupied France. Like most of the work of Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, much of it was written in the cafes of the left bank of the River Seine in Paris, in the cafe atmosphere filled with the sounds of voices and the clinking of silverware and dishes, the smells of coffee, liquor, cigarettes, and food, and the sights of the customers entering, leaving, and circulating among their friends seated at the brightly lighted tables. Sartre was a regular at the cafe called the Dome, later at the cafe de Floor, both of them on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, a street similar to 8th Street in New York's Greenwich Village. Sartre has occasionally been accused of being a café philosopher, suggesting that his writing is not serious scholarship, or that it is only a mirror for the passing human scene, for the fascinating but frivolous flux of the café, rather than being concerned with the serious realm of truth.
But in defense of Sartre, it is only fair to say that many things recommended the cafe as a place to write at that time. First, and of immediate importance, the cafes were heated, unlike the bitter cold of the tiny, ugly, left-bank hotel rooms in which Sartre lived during the war years. Moreover, the cafes of the great European cities have traditionally been places of intellectual stimulation, gathering places for artists, intellectuals, radicals of the left and right, but especially for Sartre, who was seeking, like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche before him, to develop a philosophy of human existence which will provide moral guidance for human beings. The life of the cafe is a continual bubbling source of the concrete human existence which he wishes to capture. What then does the massive, difficult philosophical treatise being in nothingness, this cafe product of the harsh years of the German occupation of France, have to tell us about the human condition? In the introduction to being in nothingness, uh, Sartre calls uh, the first part the pursuit of being. Sartre wants to follow Descartes in making my consciousness the starting point of philosophy. He wants to follow Descartes' fundamental viewpoint of subjectivism, the view that what I can know with certainty is only my own consciousness and its ideas. But Sartre finds it necessary to revise Descartes. I am conscious of thinking, says Sartre, but there is no basis for Descartes' claim that this proves my existence as a substance whose essence it is to think. I have no substantial continuing self, which I can know, says Sartre. Nobody lives there anymore, as Rocantin said. Secondly, in opposition to Descartes, Sartre agrees with the philosopher Husserl's view of consciousness as intentional, as intending or referring to an object. Consciousness is always of an object, says Sartre. Consciousness points to what is other than itself, to things which are outside it and stand over against my consciousness and confront my consciousness as the ugly root of the chestnut tree confronted Rocantin's consciousness. In itself, says Sartre, consciousness is empty, nothing. It is a nothingness. It exists only as consciousness of some object. I am aware of an object and of the fact that I am aware. Now Sartre has laid the foundation for his philosophy. There are two absolutely separate kinds of beings, two regions of being, as he says. There is the being of myself as conscious being and the being of that which is other than myself, separate from myself, the object of which I am conscious. My conscious being, Sartre now calls being for itself. To be a conscious being for Sartre is to be a being for itself, by which he means a being which is conscious of itself and of objects. But there is the opposing kind of being, being in itself, the being of the objects of consciousness, the being of existing things, an apple, a stone, a chestnut tree. Things are causally determined to be what they are. They have no freedom, they have no consciousness, and they simply exist solidly as what they are, like the root of the chestnut tree. Sartre will now call this region of being, being in itself. We move on now with Sartre from the introduction to part one of Being and Nothingness, entitled The Problem of Nothingness. To be a human being, Sartre has told us so far, is to be this concrete conscious being, this being for itself, confronting a kind of being which it is not, the realm of objects, of things, of being in itself. To be a human being is to be in the world and to be aware of not being the objects of the world, to be aware of a gap between my conscious being and the objects of the world, to be aware of an emptiness, a nothingness that separates me from the world of objects. Sartre will now try to argue that to be a conscious being, to be a being for itself, is to be characterized by endlessly bringing nothingness into the world of being. 
What is Sartre up to? What does he mean by saying that to be conscious, to be a conscious human being, is to bring nothingness into the world? Sartre is trying to show you that conscious being is totally different from, separate from, outside of the causal deterministic order of things. In the causal deterministic order of things, all things are what they are, causally determined to be. They exist as they are, without any freedom, without consciousness, without awareness of gaps, without raising any questions, without being aware of any lacks or any possibilities, without any questions or doubts. Sartre is trying to make you see that conscious being is the only kind of being which has the power to separate itself by a gap from the solid causal world of objects by being aware that it is not an object. It is also only because you are a conscious being that you can think of what you lack, do not have. What are your possibilities which are not now actual? Only as a conscious being can you be unsatisfied with yourself and desire not to be what you now are and desire to be what you are not. In all of these capacities on your part, your awareness that your consciousness is not the objects of which it is, of which it is conscious, your awareness of lacks of possibilities, of unsatisfied desires. In all of these ways, you have been conscious of what is not the case, of what is not present, of what is not actual. You have been conscious of negating what is not, says Satra. And so, says Satra, you have brought negation, nothingness, into the world. This is what Satra means by saying that nothingness enters the world with conscious beings, with concrete human existence. Another example of nothingness entering the world, another example of conscious being bringing nothingness into the world, is that conscious beings raise questions. Satra says the human capacity to ask questions brings nothingness into the world. To take the attitude of a questioner, to ask, where is Pierre in the cafe, is to open up the possibility of his not being there. It is again to introduce the notion of what is not the case, the notion of negation or nothingness. Here is Sartre's famous example of someone entering a cafe and looking for his friend Pierre, who is not there. And Sartre says in Being in Nothingness, it is certain that the cafe has been. It is certain that the cafe in itself, with its customers, tables, seats, mirrors, and lights, and its smoky atmosphere filled with the clatter of cups and saucers, the sound of voices and feet, it is a thing full of being. It is being in itself. But when this man asks the question, where is Pierre? And he fails to see Pierre. The being of the cafe dissolves, becomes a nothing. The cafe is reduced to a mere background for the face of Pierre that he is looking for. The being of the cafe is made into nothing. It is negated, annihilated by the question, where is Pierre? Moreover, in asking any question about the world, says Sartre, the questioner is detaching himself, separating himself, dissociating himself from the causal series of nature, the world of things, the world of being in itself. Only conscious beings like us have this capacity to question and so to withdraw from the bare existence of things in the causal order. Only conscious beings like us have the capacity not to be part of the world of things and to introduce a gap, a nothingness between our consciousness and the world of things. And so Sartre is able to make his dramatic conclusion that it is through man that nothingness comes into the world of being. He says, man presents himself as a being who causes nothingness to arise in the world. And again, Sartre says, man secretes his own nothingness. Suddenly, however, Sartre shows you that the nothingness, the negation which human beings bring into the world is at the same time human freedom. 
suddenly I begin to discover what it means to be a human being. It is to be free from the causally determined world of things. And it is to be free to negate, to say no, to question, to imagine possibilities which are not present, to reduce to nothingness, to negate, annihilate the region of things, of being in itself, by my questions. As the cafe dissolves into nothingness by the question, where is Pierre? And I suddenly become aware that my freedom as conscious being, as being for itself, is my power. As conscious being, I have the power of negation, the identical power of Hegel's principle of negation, the power to negate, annihilate, and annihilate, to break up and destroy. Sartre wants to show you that just as Hegel's principle of negation negates, annihilates, cancels, breaks up every stage of the dialectical process, so as a conscious being, I have the freedom and the power to negate, to separate myself from, to question, deny any object of my consciousness. Freedom is the most important aspect of conscious being, the freedom from the causally determined world of things and the power of negation. Through my freedom as conscious being, I am aware that I am not any of the objects before my consciousness. I question, I deny, I think of what is absent, of what is not the case, of what my future job possibilities are, which do not exist at present. I think of how I would like to change my personality or my appearance to be other than what they are now. I think of the future greatness for the United States, which it lacks at the present time. Sartre's point is that to be a conscious being is to be free and to have the power of negation. Freedom sets conscious being, being for itself, over against being in itself, the world of things. But now, dramatically, Sartre says, that my freedom as a conscious being enters my own existence. As a conscious being, I am totally free and undetermined. Since I am totally free, my past does not determine what I am now. Between myself as I am now and my past, I have put a gap in nothingness. I am free from my past. Take the case of a gambler, says Satra, a gambler who has resolved that he will gamble no more. When he is confronted with the gaming tables today, his past resolution does not determine what he does now. He finds that he is totally free. He is not determined by his past resolution. This new situation requires that he make a new choice, a choice that is totally free and wholly unpredictable, since conscious beings are totally free. We may add other examples to Sartre's example of the gambler. Doesn't every alcoholic Every compulsive eater, everyone addicted to cigarettes or drugs, recognize the truth of Sartre's point that conscious beings are totally free. Every time I am confronted by whatever my temptation, I discover that I am free, that yesterday's resolution does not determine what I do now, that now I must choose again. Will I or will I not stick to my resolution not to drink or smoke or overeat? This is the freedom of conscious being, which we all painfully discover. Just as my past does not determine what I am now, so what I am now does not determine my future. Suppose I choose, from among the possibilities that I have, to become a writer. Since I am totally free, my future actions are not determined by this present choice to become a writer. What I will actually do at a future moment when I am uncertain about my writing career will be a totally free action on my part, a new choice and wholly unpredictable. Every writer who has ever suffered from writer's block and faced the choice of continuing to struggle or giving it all up is painfully aware of this. And so I begin to understand what it is to be totally free. Against Freud, Sartre argues that I am not causally determined by antecedent psychological conditions of my life. Against Marx, Sartre argues that I am not determined by the mode of production and class conflict of my society. I am totally free. 
But do not the sciences of the 20th century tell me that I am totally determined, not totally free? Do they not tell me that I am the inevitable, necessary product of an overwhelming set of conditions, that I am totally determined by biological, social, economic, historical, and psychological conditions? Then these conditions which determine me, are they not responsible for what I am or do? Sartre savagely denounces Marx, Freud, and the sciences for viewing human beings as if they were causally determined things within the region of being in itself, rather than viewing them as free conscious beings. The facts of my life, says Sartre, may be biologically, psychologically, socially, and economically determined. But as conscious being, I choose the meaning they have for me. I live in a world of my own making by the meaning I choose to give the facts of my life and by the projects I choose for myself. And so I cannot say my conditioning is responsible for what I do, but for my conditioning I would be so and so. My conditioning, says Sartre, is only the region of things, the region of being in itself, the world of facts, over against which I stand as a free conscious being, choosing the meaning I will give them. A man is always free, says Sartre, during the German occupation of France. He is always free to be a traitor or not. In the fiercest opposition to the view that the facts of the world make a man an alcoholic or a drug addict, Sartre argues that an alcoholic lives in a world of his own making by the meaning he has chosen to give his life and by choosing to live it as an alcoholic. Are you an addict of alcohol or food or drugs or tobacco? Sartre says you have chosen this and that you are free to choose another way to live your life. Nothing in your past prevents you. You are not determined by your past. But now Sartre shows us that there is even a greater depth to my freedom as conscious being. As a totally free conscious being, I discover that I alone give meaning to my world. I alone am responsible for the meaning of the world in which I live. The region of fact has only the meaning that conscious beings like me give it. But there is no absolute truth to which I can any longer turn to provide meaning for my life. I have no essence to guide me. And God is dead, says Sartre, along with Nietzsche. And there is no substitute independent realm of truth. No such independent realm of truth is to be found in science or in philosophy. And I see that I alone, says Sartre, give the world its meaning. I alone am the source of whatever meaning, whatever truth or value the world has. I alone absurdly am responsible for giving meaning to the world without having any essence or human nature, without God or any objective truth or value to support me. Everything that might be a foundation for me has collapsed. The existence of God, the universal truths of philosophy, the old beliefs in eternal values. And now I have the shattering awareness that by being totally free, I am totally responsible for my choices, totally responsible for what I am and do, totally responsible even for giving meaning and value to the world, and without any support from God or any absolute truth or value. And I totter on the brink of nothingness. I experience dizziness, vertigo, and anguish. Anguish is the recognition of my total freedom. Anguish is the realization that my total freedom is also my total responsibility to choose what I am and do, and to choose the very meaning of the world. What has Sartre done? He has flung me from freedom to anguish. He has flung me from hope to despair. I am indeed free, says Sartre, but my freedom is a dreadful freedom. I alone choose and am responsible for everything. I am, I do, or I think. But I did not choose to be free. As conscious being, I am condemned to be free. But we try to escape this dreadful freedom. We try to avoid the anxiety which we experience when we are face to face with our own freedom. 
I long not to be condemned to freedom. I long not to have to live as an empty, isolated, frustrated, dissatisfied self, questioning and negating in my endless, dreadful freedom. I would wish to be simply a thing, a being in itself, like a stone or a glass. A stone, like all things, all being in itself, says Sartre, is massive and solid and glued to itself. Things have no gaps. They do not bring nothingness into the world. They do not feel lack. They do not feel dissatisfaction. They do not endlessly pursue possibilities and new projects. They do not freely choose and then bear the responsibility for their choice. But to try this, to seek to be a thing, to seek to escape from my freedom and responsibility, Sartre calls bad faith. Bad faith is the attempt to escape from my freedom by pretending to be a thing. We flee from anguish, says Sartre bitingly, by pretending to look at ourselves as a thing. But bad faith is self-deception. It is a lie, we tell to ourselves. It is a lie in the soul, says Sartre. We are not things. We are totally free, conscious beings. But endlessly we escape from this painful truth about ourselves by the many forms of bad faith. Sartre now presents his famous examples of bad faith. Take the case of the courtship, says Sartre, a girl and a man on their first date perhaps in a theater. The girl knows very well the intentions of the man. And she also knows, says Sartre, that sooner or later she will have to make a decision. But when she feels him take her hand, she postpones the decision of whether or not to accept him. And so she pretends that she has not noticed that he has taken her hand. Her hand has become a thing, resting passively in the warm hand of the man beside her. But she is in bad faith, Sartre points out. She is pretending that she is a thing and not a conscious free being, and that she is not responsible for what is going on. But of course, she is responsible. Or take the case of the waiter in the cafe, says Sartre. His movements are a little too precise, too rapid. He bends forward a little too eagerly, a little too solicitous for the customer's order. He has escaped from his freedom as a conscious being into acting a part, playing a social role, as if his essence is to be this perfect mechanism, the perfect waiter. But he is in bad faith. His essence is not to be a perfect waiter. He has no essence. He has consciously chosen to be a waiter. But he has escaped from his freedom as a person into becoming a mechanism in which he will gain social approval and avoid having to feel anything. Or take the case of the homosexual, says Sartre. The homosexual who says, I am a homosexual as if this were something that is his destiny, as if this were something that is involuntary on his part, that it is something which he cannot help any more than a table can help being a table, or a red-haired man can help being red-haired. This homosexual, too, is in bad faith, says Sartre. He is trying to escape from his freedom and his responsibility as a conscious being for choosing what he is and what he does by thinking of himself as a thing conditioned by his past and fated by his past to be a homosexual. These are Sartre's famous examples of bad faith. But the question that will haunt being and nothingness from this point on is whether good faith is at all possible for conscious beings. What is good faith? This is the problem of ethics, of moral philosophy. We shall turn to Sartre's ethics next time.
When France was finally liberated from the Nazis and World War II came to an end in 1945, all of France, in its artistic, literary, and intellectual life, was swept up in a wild enthusiasm for Jean-Paul Sartre, the champion of human freedom, which they were celebrating. Sartre's philosophy of existentialism overwhelmed France. It dominated the intellectual and political and artistic life of the French people. And its power became so threatening that it was soon condemned by both the Roman Catholic Church and the Communist Party. The entire philosophy of Sartre was condemned for its atheism by the Roman Catholic Church in October 1948 and placed on the Index of Forbidden Books. And in December of 1948, Sartre was condemned as a bourgeois subjectivist at the Communist Party Peace Conference in Poland, and he was branded as a jackal with a typewriter and a hyena with a fountain pen. An example of the tremendous popularity of Sartre at this time was the scene at the lecture he gave in the evening of October 19th, 1945, in Paris, at the Club Maintenon, the Now Club. Reports are that such a crowd struggled to get into the room in which Sartre was to give his lecture, that 30 chairs were broken in the scuffle, and the audience so packed the room that 15 people fainted. The lecture which Sartre delivered is now famous under the title, Existentialism is a Humanism. Sartre, as usual, brought home to his audience the meaning of his philosophical points by concrete illustrations, by examples drawn from the current scene, from the lived life of his and their own time. And so, to illustrate his ethics, the moral philosophy of his existentialism, Sartre told his audience the following story about one of his own students. The student came to Sartre for advice during the humiliating years of the German occupation of France from 1940 to 1944. What shall I do? The young French student asked Sartre. His mother was now alone and lived only for him and was totally dependent on his helping her to go on living. I want to stay with her in France and help her, said the student. But I also want to go to England where I can fight the Germans by joining the free French army there. Which should I choose? Sartre points out that the student was hesitating between two kinds of morality, the morality of personal devotion and the morality of defending the whole society. Sartre says that the only possible reply he could make was to tell him that moral rules cannot guide us in concrete moral problems and that he must choose alone without the benefit of any abstract moral principles and take the responsibility for whatever he chooses to do. But does it not strike you as incredible that Sartre, the great master of French existentialism, has nothing more to offer the morally conflicted student than to say, choose and take the responsibility? Does not Sartre present himself, along with Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, as being the type of philosopher who wants to offer a philosophy for modern man to live by, a philosophy which will provide guidance for man in the modern world? What does Sartre offer us as a moral philosophy for our time? The key to his moral philosophy he already gave us in his concept of bad faith. Bad faith, we have seen, is lying to oneself. It is self-deception. It is pretending that we are not free and responsible for what we are and what we do. Bad faith is pretending that we are causally determined, as inanimate things are, and that we have no freedom and are not responsible for our lives, that we are only victims of circumstances, passive products of our conditioning. But to be in bad faith is inauthentic. It is not being true to what we are as free and responsible conscious beings. In place of bad faith, Sartre sometimes uses the closely related concept of inauthenticity. Inauthenticity is the attempt to escape from the truth of what we are as conscious beings, free to choose the meaning of our world, free to make ourselves by the projects which we choose and totally responsible. And Sartre also claims that bad faith and inauthenticity involve us in alienation. To live in the self-deception of bad faith, to live in the inauthenticity of being untrue to human conscious being, is to live in alienation from oneself, to be alienated from one's own freedom as conscious being, and to regard oneself as a thing compelled by circumstances.
Still another related concept which Sartre uses is the spirit of seriousness. Sartre makes a devastating use of the spirit of seriousness to attack all those human types who accept the ordinary conventional morality of their own time as if this morality was an eternal truth of the world, as if this morality belonged to the nature of things rather than being what they choose and are therefore responsible for. In the novel Nausea, Sartre lashes out at the spirit of seriousness of those men, those pillars of society, those eminent citizens whose portraits hang in the art gallery of the city of Bouville. Rocantin detests them for the smugness with which they seem to regard the ordinary moral values by which they have lived their lives and made their contributions to the city of Bouville. They lived profitable lives at the top of the heap, financially, politically, and socially, by means of the spirit of seriousness, acting as if their moral values were physical laws of the universe, compelling them to act as they did. Sartre calls these eminent citizens of Bouville, Mudville, swine, stinkers, dirty pigs. And he says, values do not belong to the world. We are not determined by our moral values, says Sartre, as if they were physical laws. Values, like nothingness, enter the world only through human beings, through us. And we live like pigs if we do not see that we bear the responsibility for choosing them, for acting on them. Suppose then we wish not to live like filthy swine, wallowing in the sticky mud of conventional morality. Suppose we wish to avoid bad faith, inauthenticity, self-alienation, the spirit of seriousness. What then, according to Sartre, is morally right action, action which does not fall into any of these traps? Sartre's answer is that I am acting morally when I abandon self-deception and make my moral choice in recognition that I am a free conscious being in choosing and am responsible for what I choose. I am acting morally in choosing as a free and responsible human being. But what shall I choose? On the basis of what principles, what ideals, what norms or standards do I choose? What universal values guide me in my actions? What is Sartre's answer? There are no moral ideals, no universal values to guide you. But here we have come face to face with a paradox that Sartre's existentialism, which has forced me to recognize and avoid my tendencies to fall into self-deception, bad faith, inauthenticity, and the spirit of seriousness. This existentialism has, however, no principles, no ideals, no norms or standards, no universal values to give me any moral direction or guidance. Existentialist ethics must be said to be an attempt to provide moral philosophy without offering any principles for making moral choices or for guiding moral action. Absurdly, Sartre's existentialist ethics wags a moralizing finger at us, making us morally anxious about falling into bad faith. It frightens us into avoiding piggish inauthenticity and into recognizing that we are free in choosing and are responsible for our choices but it is without any ability to give us any principles by which to choose. But why is this so? Why is existentialist ethics bankrupt, unable to provide us with principles or ideals which can point to what is the good for human life and what is right for me to do? Sartre explains this in various ways. In the lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism, he takes the position of the German philosopher Nietzsche, that God is dead. And Sartre says, the Existentialist finds it extremely embarrassing that God does not exist, for there disappears with him all possibility of finding values in an intelligible heaven. To state Sartre's point in the simplest way, since God is dead, there is no longer any source of absolute values for man. It is nowhere written, says Sartre, that the good exists, that one must be honest or must not lie, 
since we are now upon the plane where there are only men. Since God does not exist, he cannot be the foundation for our moral life. Immediately, Sartre quotes the great Russian novelist Dostoevsky and Dostoevsky's startling claim that if God did not exist, everything would be permitted. And Sartre says that for existentialism is the starting point. Without God, everything is permitted and we are free. God's laws, God's rules are no longer binding upon man. With the death of God, we are now left alone in the universe as the only conscious beings. Moreover, our existence as conscious beings precedes our essence, since strictly in the absence of God, human beings have no essence. There is no human nature which they share. In this way, Sartre reaches the conclusion that no moral values or ideals are any longer available to us. No platonic essence of man or of human nature directs us to fulfill our essence or our human nature. And no God presents us with a divine ideal of human goodness and virtue for us to aspire to achieve. In a sudden burst of eloquence in the packed public lecture, Sartre sums this up and he says, Thus we have neither behind us nor before us in a luminous realm of values any means of justification or excuse. We are left alone without excuse. That is what I mean when I say, says Sartre, that man is condemned to be free. We are without any means of justification or excuse, Sartre tells us. We have no excuse for denying our freedom. The death of God has set us free from his rules and his governing of the world. We are free, but without any means of justification, without any moral principles to justify what we do, to serve as a foundation for our lives. There is also another line of explanation which Sartre gives for there being no existentialist ideals or moral values to guide your life. This line of explanation closes out the possibility that you might discover values for human beings in the world of nature. But Sartre has already closed out this possibility by his view of the region of things, of nature, of being in itself, as causally determined, without freedom, without consciousness, simply, brutally, superfluously there. Values do not belong to nature, to the world. They belong to us, to being for itself, to conscious beings. Values, like nothingness and negation, enter the world only with conscious beings. I turn in vain to nature, to the world of things, to find any values which would justify my moral life. And so I am brought back again to recognize my dreadful freedom, that no foundation for my moral life is to be found outside me, that I myself, as a free conscious being, am the only foundation of my moral values and ideals. And I myself have no foundation. I am only an empty, freely negating consciousness without substance and without essence. Sartre has already made this point in a powerfully crushing way in the first section of Being and Nothingness, where he said, My freedom is the unique foundation of values, and nothing, absolutely nothing, justifies me in adopting this or that particular value or a particular scale of values. And this is why. Sartre's only reply to his student's moral problem was, choose. Now we can see clearly that for Sartrean existentialism, ethics is impossible. There are no moral values or rules or ideals or principles which can serve as the basis for ethics and which can justify one kind of life, one kind of moral decision rather than another. And so, our first criticism of Sartre's existentialism is that it has made ethics impossible. A second criticism is that Sartre has indeed given us one principle for our action, to avoid bad faith, to act authentically. That is, to act with the consciousness that I am free in what I am choosing to do and responsible for my choice. But 
since Sartre has removed any justification for choosing A rather than B, then my choice is arbitrary. It is simply my choice, but it has no foundation. It is absurd. The rule, avoid bad faith, choose authentically, simply tells me to acknowledge my freedom in choosing. But it is not a moral rule. It is an empty rule. It contains no content as to what is morally worth anything or what is morally hideous. A third criticism of Sartre's existentialist ethics is that since the only rule it provides me with is the rule against self-deception and bad faith, then I have done all that is required of me so long as I follow this rule and avoid bad faith and acknowledge that I alone freely choose what I do and am responsible. But then anything that I freely choose to do meets the requirements of authenticity. One freely chosen act is as good as another and there is no way out for discriminating between my freely chosen acts. Sartre himself sees this and he says toward the end of being and nothingness, all human activities are equivalent. And he adds, intending to shock us. It comes to the same thing, whether one gets drunk alone or is a leader of nations. Both ways of life, undertaken freely, are equivalent. A last criticism of Sartre's existentialist ethics is that we see it now as an ethics hovering at the edge of nihilism. Nihilism may be defined as the viewpoint which expresses bitter disillusionment, that human reason is powerless to justify one moral value over another, and that since all actions are therefore equivalent, nothing has any value, and only force and violence can take control. Is there no exit for Sartre from the charge that he has destroyed the foundation for ethics and that he has led us into nihilism? Already, in the lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism, Sartre was seeking an exit. Hastily, in this public lecture, he attempted to provide a foundation for human life. This was his well-known attempt to argue that Existentialism shares the moral values of traditional Humanism specifically humanism's value of freedom for all humankind. Sartre tries to argue that for existentialism, my choosing my own freedom as a conscious being necessarily involves my choosing freedom for all others. However, nothing that Sartre has told us in nausea or in being and nothingness was based upon the humanistic value of universal freedom. In fact, Sartre has consistently taken the opposite view, that your freedom is a threat and an obstacle to mine. Your freedom for Sartre is my slavery. Let us turn to Sartre's view of human relations, hoping to see if there is an exit for him there. The best introduction to Sartre's view of the way conscious beings relate to one another is his play, No Exit which was the first play to be performed in Paris after the liberation from the German army. It was performed on September 20th, 1944, and was immediately a huge success. And it has become a classic and has been constantly performed ever since. It has only three actors and no change of scenery. The three characters, a man and two women, one of whom is a lesbian, walk separately into a brightly lighted room furnished with three small sofas, knowing that they are dead and have been sent here to hell. Yet there are no instruments to torture them. There are no hell fires to burn them. There are only the other two people. Soon the horrible truth dawns upon them that they are one another's torturers. Their damnation is for all eternity to torment one another. By the end of the play, they have tortured each other excruciatingly, and they have made the discovery that in hell there is no need for hell fire. As the male character says, hell is other people. That hell is other people is the core of Sartre's view of the way conscious beings relate to each other. Human relationships constitute the topic of part three of Being and Nothingness under the heading Being for Others. I exist as a conscious being, says Sartre, in a world of other conscious beings, in a world of being for others. 
I have being for others in two ways, says Sartre. First, I become aware of my own body as something which is known to other people. For other people, I am at first a body, a being in itself, although to myself, I am a conscious being, a being for itself. Second, I become aware of the bodies of other people and in this way of their existence as conscious beings. Sartre begins his highly original and penetrating psychological analysis of my being for others with his claim that I become fully aware of myself only when I am aware that I am an object for someone else's perception. Sartre is here following in the footsteps of Hegel. Hegel had said, I can be conscious of myself only as I am reflected in the consciousness of the other. Going beyond Hegel is Sartre's concept of the look. What does it mean for me to be aware that I am being looked at? Sartre gives us the unforgettable example of a peeping Tom, a voyeur, bending down to peer into an apartment through a keyhole, driven by sexual curiosity or by jealousy of the people in the apartment. The peeping Tom is aware only of what he sees through the keyhole. But suddenly, says Sartre, I hear footsteps in the hall. Someone is looking at me. And I am seized by shock and shame at being the kind of person the other is now perceiving me to be. Suddenly, by the look of the other, my world, as it had appeared to me, is drained away, goes down the drain, as Sartre says. Two things have happened to me as a result of my seeing the look of the other. First, I have become an object of the other's look. He sees me as a body. I am thing-like in his eyes. The other person relates to me by trying to predict now how I will behave, as he would try to predict how an animal or a plant will behave in certain circumstances. I am what he makes of me, not what I make myself. The second result of being looked at by the other person is that I begin to see that I am no longer master of my situation. The other is making his own predictions of me. He has been looking me over and making his own evaluations of me as a person. He is judging me and putting labels on me. In my own defense, I try to overcome the other's freedom, which has the power to negate, to destroy my own freedom. As Sartre says, while I attempt to free myself from the hold of the other, the other is trying to free himself from mine. While I seek to enslave the other, the other seeks to enslave me. Descriptions of concrete behavior, says Sartre, must therefore be seen within the perspectives of conflict. And Sartre concludes with one of his most famous lines, conflict is the original meaning of being for others. Once again, we see how Sartre is borrowing from Hegel, here from Hegel's master-slave relationship, which clearly lies behind what Sartre means by being for others. Human relations for Sartre are those of masters and slaves, with even more subtle and frightening implications than Hegel had imagined. What I want, says Sartre, is to possess the other's freedom. I want to enslave the other as free. Only this will satisfy me. If the other has no freedom, enslaving him will not satisfy me. But if he is free, on the other hand, he will escape my possession of him. I will lose the satisfaction of mastery over his freedom. Sartre says later, in 1945, in the lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism, that existentialism shares humanism's respect for human freedom. But here, in Being and Nothingness, Sartre describes all human relations as those in which I seek to enslave and possess the other's freedom. I do not respect the other's freedom. In fact, Sartre adds, respect for the other's freedom is a vain word. I seek to enslave the other's freedom. And so it is that conflict is the meaning of all human relations, conflict and hopelessness. Especially hopeless is the relationship of love. In love, too, what the lover wants is not merely the physical possession of the other, but to possess the other's freedom. He does not want to enslave the beloved. He would feel cheapened by being loved by someone conditioned by psychological influences to love him. 
total enslavement of the beloved to him, a mechanical beloved, would soon kill his love. The lover does not want to possess the beloved as a thing. He wants to possess the beloved as a free person. But the desire of the lover is hopeless. How can the beloved be possessed by me as a slave and still be free? There is even a deeper significance to love, says Sartre. We suffer as conscious beings from being empty, without substance, without essence, without any foundation for our lives. Love offers us a foundation. We seek a foundation for our being in the lover, in the idea that the lover is the real foundation of my being. We say, we were made for each other. He, she, is all the world to me. Each of us is what justifies the other's existence. But this too fails, because it requires that each possess the other's freedom as the foundation of his life, and yet be freely loved by the other. But there is a contradiction here. The lover cannot be both free and my possession. And so the hopelessness of love is only another example of being for others, the world of human relations, in which I can relate to others only through enslaving or being enslaved. Love in its failure can lead to three different outcomes. I can be the slave, a masochistic object for the lover, suffering for the other's pleasure in his mastery. I can be the sadist and master the loved one by violence. Or I can observe the other in indifference. But none of these will satisfy me. In love, Sartre said, as in all our other human relationships, we end up either enslaving the other or being enslaved in the position of either sadism or masochism. We may try hating the other when we cannot possess him. But hate, says Sartre, does not enable us to get out of this circle. Nothing remains for us except to be indefinitely tossed from one to the other of the two fundamental attitudes. Human relationships are conflicted and hopeless. They are no source of moral ideals or principles. There is then in human relations no exit for Sartre from the moral bankruptcy of his existentialism. Is this wretchedness where Sartre leaves us? No. He adds a strange footnote in Being in Nothingness in which he says, these considerations do not rule out the possibility of an ethics of deliverance and salvation, but this can be achieved only after a radical conversion, which we cannot discuss here. What is this ethics of deliverance and salvation? What is this radical conversion? It is Sartre's great bombshell, his radical conversion from existentialism to Marxism and communism, a total turnabout to which we will turn next time. In 1960, Jean-Paul Sartre published The Critique of Dialectical Reason, his second huge philosophical essay. Like Being and Nothingness of 1943, it is over 700 pages long. And in the very first few pages, he drops his great bombshell. Marxism is the inescapable philosophy of our time. This is the meaning of the mysterious reference in Being and Nothingness to a radical conversion. It is Sartre's now famous conversion to Marxism. In this conversion, free, independent, conscious being, being for itself in its concrete existence, is swallowed up in Marx's proletariat. And existentialism, the philosophy of the solitary, defiant self, is swallowed up in the philosophy of mature Marxism, in Marx's scientific scenario of the dialectic of economic production. Why does Sartre claim that there is the inescapable philosophy of our time and that it is Marxism? Sartre is following Hegel and Marx. It was Hegel who argued that all philosophies are relative to their own historical time, and that every philosophy is nothing but its own time reflected in thought. And it is Marx who said that all philosophies are ideologies, reflections of the existing economic mode of production. 
Sartre is claiming for Marxism that it is the philosophy of the proletariat, a philosophy which most completely reflects the class conflict of our own time, and that Marxism will remain inescapable until the proletariat is liberated from its oppression, seizes power, and becomes the master class. How does Sartre defend his claim that it is specifically Marxism that is the inescapable philosophy of our time? He supports this bold claim only by the sweeping statement that the modern period in history has been dominated by just a few philosophers. There has been the age of Descartes and Locke, the age of Kant and Hegel, and there is now the age of Marx. There is no going beyond any of these great systems of thought, says Sartre, until changes take place in the economic relations which these philosophies reflect. And while Marxism is dominant, as it is now, we are compelled to be Marxists, to think in terms of Marxian philosophy. But then you will want to ask Sartre, what becomes of existentialism, the philosophy of the human subject, free from causal determinism, free to give the world its own meaning, isolated in its dreadful, proud freedom? Sartre's answer is that existentialism, he now sees, belongs to the class of small philosophies which are parasites, hovering on the margins of the dominant philosophy. Existentialism can, however, be integrated into Marxism, the dominant philosophy, by supplying Marxism with subjectivism, with the existentialist emphasis upon concrete human existence in concrete situations. Existentialist concern for the human subject will give a human dimension to the scientific abstractions and the dialectical necessities of mature Marxism. But that is existentialism's only purpose. From the day when Marxism takes on a human dimension, says, says Sartre, existentialism will no longer have a reason for being. But in the critique of dialectical reason, where Sartre was to have demonstrated the power of existentialism to humanize Marxism, to bring the human subject back into the scientific scenario of Marx, the concrete human subject has disappeared from sight into the organized social group. How then can we explain Sartre's radical conversion from existentialism to Marxism? Sartre wanted to describe the total freedom of the modern, urban, rootless, disaffected intellectual in the modern world. And at the same time, he wanted to idealize total freedom as the only truly human and redeemable aspect of our lives. The result? Sartre has had to take an extreme position to achieve the total freedom of conscious being, he has isolated me as an empty, negating consciousness with nothingness at my core rather than a substantial self. I have no foundation in myself, no essence, no human nature to set a standard for me. I have no foundation in nature itself which is hostile, nauseating, and viscous. I cannot claim a foundation in any religion or in any philosophical values. I try to fill my nothingness with love, with a foundation in the lover, but this fails. I try to give myself a foundation by various forms of bad faith. All of them fail. One type of bad faith <clears throat> is anti-Semitism. In Sartre's essay, Reflections on the Jewish Question, Sartre says, the key to the problem is to understand the Frenchman who is an anti-Semite. The Frenchmen who are anti-Semites, says Sartre, are usually mediocre persons of low social status who try to compensate for their insignificance by making a scapegoat of the Jews. These Frenchmen become thing-like, rock-like as Frenchmen, claiming that by being French, they have a feeling for France and a mystical French sensibility, which gives them at least a superiority over Jews, even though Jews may be more intelligent. But this pretense to have a foundation in being a rock-like thing as a Frenchman fails. It is self-deception. We are not things. 
It is in this crisis, this extreme situation, in which total freedom has led to total isolation and despair of any foundation, that Sartre makes the leap to Marxism, which will provide the ethics which existentialism lacks, which will provide an ethics of deliverance and salvation. But why did Sartre not recognize that this was bad faith? Why did he not see that to become a Marxist and a member of the Communist Party is to become thing-like? It is to accept dogmas. It is to adhere to a ready-made, tailor-made ethics for the group. It is to submit to party authority. It is to surrender my freedom in choosing. It is to surrender the control over every aspect of my life. The only possible explanation is that aside from Marxism, Sartre saw no exit from the dreadful, absurd freedom he himself had created. He had been prepared for moving toward Marxism by his own long-standing hatred of the bourgeoisie, by his hatred of capitalism, by his concept of conflict in social relations, and by his concept of alienation. Having made the dialectical swing to a Marxism of his own construction, Sartre proceeded to support Stalin's purges of the intellectuals and professionals in Russia. He supported the notorious concentration camps. He has supported violence for colonial freedom. He supported the communist revolution in Cuba and China. He turned down the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1964 because it might appear to be acceptance of a bourgeois honor. He is passionately anti-American and presided over a war crimes tribunal in Sweden, which was set up to indict the United States for atrocities it was supposedly committed in Vietnam. But since May 1968, when the French Communist Party refused to join students and workers in a general strike, Sartre accused the Communist Party of betraying the revolutionary cause. He broke at that point with the Communist Party and said in 1977 that he is and has always been a political anarchist. And so Sartre has returned to his original posture of radical individualism.